Good morning. Hi, Guy. Good morning, Christian. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Great to have you with us. Uh, welcome to another SportWorks Talks. Uh, today we're going to cover a very important topic and very t very topical uh, based on what's happening around the world um, and going to give a really uh, looking forward to a really unique insight into you know as I say un unfortunately you've been through this sort of experience of a pandemic or epidemic twice having experienced what happened in Hong Kong in SARS in 2003 so you're one of the unfortunate people who's been through this before um, and I think it'll be really interesting to get your um, experience and uh, also the view to what happened, the positive things that came out of it um, and how things were kick-started. So really looking forward to hearing your presentation this morning. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we, as always, we, we usually run these set, uh, for about 20 minutes of presentation and then we have uh, 20 minutes of Q&A, thereabouts. Um, what we ask is that you put your questions into the chat um, in the uh, in the poll, and we can then um, ask answer your questions as we go through towards the end of the session. We'll mark all of the uh, responses uh, as we go. Um, also. Um, if we don't get to your question, uh, we'll do our best to answer them post-event. Um, we'll set up a discussion forum so we can uh, do our best to answer them there as well. Uh, so if you have anything, come up. Um, the last thing I'd ask is, you know, please say hi in the chat. We'd love to know where you are from around the world. Um, great to see that uh, we, we're reaching out across the globe. And I believe we're reaching out to many of our colleagues in, in China and, and Hong Kong. So welcome to you. Uh, your evening, I believe, or late afternoon. So. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Guy and say welcome to SportWorks Talks. Great. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, and without further ado, I will jump into the first slide. Um, The title of the talk, The Role of Sport in a Post-Virus Society, Learnings from 2003 SARS Crisis in Asia. Um, now, some of you listening today and some of you participating may not be that familiar with Asia. So I thought it was a good idea just to give you a quick tour and a quick history of sports marketing in the region over the last few years. Um, so that you are um, you're familiar with how also I ended up being there. I was a student. I was a student from uni who signed up to join an, an environmental research expedition without much knowledge or expertise. I spent two months in southern China around Guilin and then also up into uh, Sichuan province and down in Hainan. Um, I then got a proper job with the Kellogg Company of Great Britain and was uh, marketing for uh, you know Cocoa Pops and Rice Krispies and all brand. And then one day I thought, you know what, I'd love to go back to China and go back and study again environmental research. And I became a team leader for 100 students, 50 Chinese and 50 Western students. And we spent the best part of four or five months working with different villages in China as tourism, as uh, economic development, and as farming was freed from the Cultural Revolution. And farmers in this part of China could start to choose to grow and commercialize their own crops. I started to begin to learn Chinese at the time, which has uh, stayed with me for the last 20 odd years. Um, I moved to Hong Kong, my girlfriend joined me at the time, now my wife Jo, and um, met three guys in a bar who were tennis players, and we started a sports marketing company. No experience, no background, no funding. The beginning of the 90s was just when brands were starting and just when national media was catching on in the Chinese market, so great time. I joined a big global sports marketing company, ISL in 95, and then in 2002 joined the Swedish agency IEC in sports, of which 2003 are the key years when all this was going on. If you look back at Europe in the Second World War, there's been smooth, smooth progress in sport, in business, in commerce since the end of the Second World War, right up to probably now, which is the first interruption. Asia has not been the same story. Um, 
Korea had been divided by the Korean War. Japan had been rebuilding after the Second World War and became a, an industrial powerhouse in the, um, in the 1970s. China was still going through complete chaos and disorganization following, even before the Second World War, you had the nationalists, um, nationalist uprising and the split to Taiwan. You had the Second World War impact, you had Japanese occupation, and then you had, of course, the Great Leap Forward and then the Cultural Revolution, which lasted until the mid 70s, and in fact, into southern China, into the mid, mid 80s, when collective farming was still practiced. Vietnam was still undergoing uh, the Vietnamese, the Vietnam War with, with the states, the communists and nationalists, etc. And Laos and Cambodia had just come out of their conflicts. So you had a real late start into our industry of sport. Um, China only joined FIFA and the IOC in the 1970s. They only had their first gold medal at the, the LA Games with Li Ning in 1984. And a lot of this impetus was through one man, one man who was Henry Falk, who facilitated the introductions for China into FIFA and into these organizations, a Hong Kong businessman, a very successful businessman who used sport as part of his philanthropy to build relations with China and its, and its leadership. Hong Kong remained throughout that time a key location where sporting investment and, and the management of sports rights happened from. Uh, Asian football and its marketing came out of Hong Kong and still does to this very day. Um, Timothy Falk and the Olympic Committee in Hong Kong were the driving force behind the Olympic Council of Asia for many, many years. So Hong Kong as a gateway for knowledge expertise between East and West um, continues all the way through this story. Um, China lagged behind its neighbors, Japan and Korea, until Osaka, 1994, when China topped the medal table for the first time. Um, it staged the Asian Games in 1990. Many of those venues still existed. And in fact, when I was working um, at Spectrum as my first agency, we staged um, the Nokia Open, the first WTA-sanctioned event in Beijing in the old Asian Games Stadium. No heating whatsoever. The girls were playing tennis in their tracksuits, absolutely brutal conditions, but that was how early pioneering sport went on. When we move on towards the Asian Games of Bangkok, um, I worked under the leadership of Chris Renner, uh, and he put together the first top star marketing program, generating in excess of 100 million US dollars with regional brands, brands from around the world, Samsung, Carlsberg, um, Acer computers who wanted a pan-regional marketing product and Asia was just offering a pan-regional block of consumers all with spending power uh, and this was a really dynamic time in the region. As we said, Japan and Korea had a head start. Japan had actually hosted three Olympic Games uh, by the time the century turned. China, on the other hand, had only just put in a bid for its first and wouldn't be staging Beijing until eight years later. So you saw, you could see there the growth and development with um, sports leagues, football leagues already operating early on in Korea and Japan in the early 90s and 80s. China only put together its National Football League in 1993 uh, and CCTV as a national sports channel in 1994. So this is, you know, 100 years later than football leagues in Latin America, in parts of Europe, for example. And this really demonstrates the speed of development and the speed of the marketing opportunity. If you had knowledge and expertise, you could contribute to this growth uh, with, a very, with a very ambitious nation, an ambitious region. Up until the 1970s, the population of China was rural. It was an agricultural economy. Japan and Korea had already become industrial nations. Taiwan also following suit. By the 1980s, after Deng Xiaoping uh, opened Shenzhen's special economic zone, we saw the Chinese population urbanize with all of the trappings that urban culture brings. Uh, and this is Shenzhen just, just on the doorstep of Hong Kong, which is now you know, one of the world's most visual, exciting, dynamic cities. Chinese football quest, well, if we, if, we, if we discount the World Cup from 1932, which was amateur teams, um, not many of you will probably remember that, um, 
China really tried from the early 90s from the Football League. Um, and we were lucky enough at ISL and with the support of FIFA that we put together the commercial program and technical program for Chinese football. Uh, we helped the Chinese hire and identify Bora Milutinovic as the national coach. We arranged training matches, practice matches. We put in place sponsorship. We, we started a ticketing system for the first time in China. And China qualified for their first World Cup in 2002 and scored their first and only goal of the World Cup. And if you're going to score a goal, you might as well score it against Brazil. At the same time, Western sports, sports like basketball, uh, the NBA had been wooing China for decades, providing them with videotapes of matches, posting beta cams to CCTV. Uh, and finally, Yao Ming probably reached the pinnacle. He was the number one draft pick in 2001. He wasn't the first in the NBA, but he became an absolute icon. That He made it on the world stage. He succeeded in probably one of the most competitive commercial global sports league, so a real high point. And of course, the next high point was Japan and Korea staging a phenomenal World Cup. Not only did their teams perform, but the idea that a nation could get behind the national team and support them, and that transferred into national pride, patriotism, and a lot of positive virtues. And that really woke up the region's appetite for hosting major sports events or being part of a world sports tour where they were rubbing shoulders with Barcelona, Berlin, New York, whether it was table tennis or golf or tennis. And the Asian appetite for sport really grew at this time. And right into this, you had consumers, you had fans who had spending power, you had Chinese consumers who wanted to suddenly travel. Uh, although at this point still in tour groups. You had Koreans who prior to the Seoul Olympics hadn't traveled, now wanted to go out and study overseas. And you had Japanese businesses setting up around the world with great technological products, uh, showing that it wasn't just a, a country of ideas, they could roll out service uh, and they, they had this very, very strong work ethic. So a huge growth with Asian consumers and also wanting to support Asian brands. So Asian football really bloomed in the early 90s and 2000s as Asian teams qualified for the World Cup and delivered, delivered national pride all the way back home. And then we come to 2003. And 2003 really started off by one doctor, one infected doctor came from a laboratory in Guangzhou, checked into a hotel in Hong Kong, got across the border, wasn't feeling well, um, coughed a few times on the way up in the elevator, got out, and at this point 17 people had been infected. And as the primary spreader, he'd infected fully of these 17 people, five who would die within the next week. The further 11 would also then perish, but not before passing on to another five to 10 people. And so the infection spread into the Hong Kong community, down to Singapore where people traveled down, and to uh, small cases in Korea, small cases in Japan. But Hong Kong was absolutely the epicenter at the time. We had no knowledge of what it was. We knew it was a virus. It, it, it now, as we can look back in 2020, was, is a kind of cousin of the coronavirus. But at that time, of course, we didn't have that knowledge. And remember, 2003, no social media, no... no um, we had you know, rudimentary internet, but our source of knowledge was public television, public radio, and newspapers. So that, that really was our source. So we were looking for clear and simple messages from our leadership as to what to do. And I think, um, Christian, if we can just roll video one, this is a great message from Betty Tung, uh, and she was the wife of the chief executive of Hong Kong at the time. Lingsan 
。身为会长嘅行政长官夫人董志红听，亦呼吁老人家注意卫生。着晒全副装备嘅董太仲特别希望啲长者谅解，俾少少了解我哋点解我哋着得咁样，我连阿婆婆都解释过，希望佢饶恕我哋点解会着成咁啦，唔担心啊假嘅，梗系要担心啦，我啲义工嚟、啊。而收到物资嘅老人家都好开心，人话自己最近都加强咗清洁屋企。咪嗰啲擺潔精啊，擦泡白水啊，咁啊擺廁所嗰啲水啊，咁擦擦擦擦啊，佢哋攞啲清水過佢咁啦。有私家醫生同立法會議員就唱歌教居民預防染病。Um, and Junjie, who's on the chat here, will provide a, a beautiful translation, I think, in, in a moment. Um, but I think we're looking for three things now um, as we look at the current coronavirus. Um, we're looking at um, uh, sanitization, so hand sanitizers, using alcohol within hand sanitizers, which Betty was on absolutely. Frequent hand washing, cleanliness, all of that stuff. You know, she's got that. Wearing masks. Absolutely, 2003, Hong Kong was completely on the ability for um, uh, infection to spread through the use of masks. And I think 74% of the population wore masks throughout the whole time. Absolutely no issues there. There were no shortages either. Um, and that, that really contributed. So those two factors were something that the city jumped on very, very early on and, and uh, pushed very hard. Also helped Margaret Chan was the director general of the WHO, Hong Kong Chinese woman. Very strong leadership, very good um, direction as well. Um, and the connection between her and the Hong Kong public was good. And that was pretty impressive that the wife of the chief executive, effectively the prime minister, was out there on the front line. What was missing? Social distancing. Absolutely no grasp of social distancing. It wasn't an issue before, during, and it clearly wasn't an issue after. Now, the disease had different uh, facets compared to uh, coronavirus. In fact, what was amazing is as the temperature went up in Hong Kong over 25C um, by about June, and the humidity went up, the virus just dissipated. It didn't like that kind of temperature thing, and it just disappeared. It just went away. It, it, it fizzled out. But you know, we weren't to know that at the time. Um, so we're still not social distancing in Hong Kong. We're living there. I'm working. I'm working a little bit from the office uh, because you couldn't work from home. You just had a 56 KB plug-in on your on your laptop, so you couldn't send attachments or anything like that. So you still went into the office, and the Hong Kong government decided what can we do to celebrate the end of SARS officially, where we're back in business. We can welcome visitors. We can gather together. Well, what better than one of the two most popular sports in Hong Kong? Horse racing is one of them, but the second one is football. And I'll just roll this video, which has got uh, Jonathan McKinley, who was the sports commissioner for Hong Kong, actually from 2010 to 16, narrating a very short story. Certainly one of the highlights of the uh, SARS relaunch in 2003 was the signing of Real Madrid uh, to come and play a one-off game against the select Hong Kong team. Now, as soon as this was announced, there was huge excitement in the city. Um, first of all, about the money involved. Uh, we were going to pay Real Madrid 2.2 million euros to interrupt their scheduled uh, Asian tour to come to Hong Kong. Uh, and, you know, from this point on, it's right up until the match itself, um, the excitement continues. Uh, and it wasn't all about the football. I mean, a lot of it was about the fact that, um, you know, Real Madrid were bringing celebrity, they were bringing lifestyle. Uh, above all, they were bringing glamour to the city at a time when uh, we really needed it. Um, and, and they were contracted to bring the Galacticos, of course. The real stars, Zinedine Zidane, Luis Figo, Roberto Carlos, Raul, and of course uh, David Beckham. Um, so 
the fans were very, very excited about this. And it's no surprise that come the match day, the Hong Kong Stadium was filled to capacity, 40,000 people, uh, to watch off this, this, to watch this one-off spectacle between uh, 11 Hong Kong lads yeah, and some of the best footballers of their generation. Um, it's certainly a, a match, I think, and uh, an event that many people who at the time saw it will remember fondly, and probably one of the highlights, in fact, maybe for many people, the highlight uh, of the post-SARS regeneration in Hong Kong. And you can, you can imagine the impact of that, the excitement, the power, and the pride and confidence that Hong Kong felt hosting Real Madrid, whining and dining with them. Uh, and of course, in those days, the players would go out for some drinks as well. They'd be seen socially, they'd be out and about. Um, and full lineup of Galactico is an amazing endorsement for the territory. During SARS, the Hong Kong population also decided themselves that there was something they could do to strengthen their immune system. They can actually make themselves healthier. They could go out in the fresh air, they can take some time in some of the most beautiful parts of Hong Kong, which I think people don't really know exist. People see Hong Kong as a mega city. The next video clip, which Jonathan also narrates, just tells you a little bit about what happened. Yes, I think the interesting thing during SARS was that people literally took to the hills, if you like. Um, rather than spending their weekends trolling around shopping malls or, or hotel lobbies, um, people really were keen to get out of the air-conditioned air, if you like, and into the fresh air and start exploring the country parks of Hong Kong. That really started to change in, in 2003 during SARS. People were going out for longer hikes, exploring the trails of the very good trail network that was, was running throughout the country parks. Um, and and you, you really saw a lot of people on the trails, far more people than you ever used to. Now, of course, at the time we thought, well, this is just going to be a bit of a fad. Um, you know, it'll wear out. People will be back in the air conditioning once the summer comes and all the rest of it. But in fact, the interesting thing is, um, is that that seemed to spark something of a, of a change in the way that people viewed the whole use of the country parks. And what you started to see, and, and what has grown right up until the present day, um, is this idea of the country parks being much more than just a passive recreational amenity, and there's nothing wrong, of course, with that, but they start to become venues for proper organised and even competitive sporting events um, of quite a high level. I mean, we now see um, something that's really grown over the years, uh, competitive trail running, mountain biking, um, action-adventure racing, all these taking part in the country park, something you wouldn't really have imagined. The government controlled all uniform spaces, as it called it. So anything that was uniform or public, it was under their jurisdiction. Post SARS, the government relaxed that control. As a private organizer, as a community club, you could organize a running race. So my wife at the time was organizing uh, amateur running races up on the peak, um, ladies, lads and lasses. 800 runners would sign up and the police would allow us to have 1,000, 1,200 runners. They understood that people needed to get out, get fresh air, strengthen their systems. Um, I'm going to go straight to the last slide now because I'm, I'm, I'm aware that we're um, um, just facing a little bit of a time thing. So I'm just going to take you through not what happened after 2003, but really what the forward thinking is today. Um, and I think the forward thinking is today, in summary, the Real Madrid match was a one-off, but let's, let's describe that as a Real Madrid moment, okay? What will happen now is that at some point in time, every country will have a Real Madrid moment. They will have an event that will be defining, that will mark a point within this pandemic, and it will issue a turning point. It will rally people around it, it will strengthen people's spirits, okay? Nobody knows what that event is going to be. No one knows what format that's going to take and how it's going to be um, conveyed and in, in, in what location. But every single person on this call has the opportunity to come up with that event concept in their territory or somewhere else. And everyone on this call can also talk to all of the people who are here and combine knowledge, information, technology and contacts to come up with that idea. 
A great example we, we just saw was um, Captain Tom Moore and his fundraising, which started from absolutely nothing. One Second World War veteran who decided to walk around his garden became the focal point for the United Kingdom and probably wider afield for a number of weeks. So it's a good idea with a strong basis that's going to lift us from this. My kind of five key points here, and I, I think I've just covered point four actually, that all of us are entrepreneurs, all of us can use technology to come up with this idea as well. Number five, all of us need to figure out how to connect with fans and people better directly. We don't need to go through third party platforms. But I do think the two, the two stepping stones we also need to think about is one, it'll be local. How things start off with sport will not involve cross-border travel. And we will champion local events before international ones. And two, sports with substantial human contact will, will come later. At the moment, will be sports with minimal human contact, which can happen with less risk of injury or less risk of human contact. Um, and as usual with all these things, Asian nations, I predict, are adept at recovering, have gone through crisis over the last 50, 60 years and upheaval, are also responsive to government edicts and respond, and they will be the ones not only responding and adapting, but also providing the crucial investment to all of the world of sport that we see here today from Lausanne. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop the presentation and hand you back to Christian. Guy, great presentation. Thank you. Uh, really great insights. Wonderful to see the story of you know the evolution of sport in uh, Southeast Asia and particularly Hong Kong and China. Um, but I just come away with that sense of hope um, and seeing the, the the good news stories of how we can use sport as that catalyst uh, to transform and, and evolve out of out of crisis. Um, so thank you so much for sharing such a, a positive, uh, insightful presentation. Uh, great, great, great stuff. Thank you. Um, and I really, I really align with the the concept that you know those people on this call um, and our collective sport worker community do have the creativity uh, to to bring to fore some of these great ideas that the real Madrid moment, as you said. So thank you for for for, for sharing that. Um, so to our audience from around the world, um, please, uh, if you've got any questions directly for Guy, um, drop them in the chat um, and we'll do our best to answer them. I think, you know, the, the, the presentation was quite comprehensive and, and gave us a very good uh, clear picture of what we did. For you personally, um, one question's come up. Um, how was it, how did you, how was it brokered the deal with Real Madrid? Obviously, this was quite a, uh, an amazing uh, outcome, but how was that triggered? Was that just... You know, someone who, who came up with the idea, where to go? Um, we, we somehow picked up that Real Madrid were coming to the region. And um, we were a, a small Stockholm headquartered sports marketing company. Um, and the two founders, um, Anders Bjornman and uh, Jonas Pearson, basically operated out of Jonas's attic using a fax machine. Um, that was it. So they probably told me, Guy, go and find out about Real Madrid and see if we can get some business. So we contacted them, you know, told them we were in the region, found out they had confirmed Beijing and Tokyo, but had a gap in their schedule. Um, and since at the time we were working with the Hong Kong Football Association, I contacted Timothy Fogg, who is Henry Fogg's son, Henry who paid for the Asian Games Stadium in Beijing and helped put China into FIFA and IOC. So the Hong Kong connection, the family connection pays off. And said to Tim, listen, Tim, um, this would be an extraordinary opportunity for Hong Kong, global media coverage. David Beckham alone brings 150 journalists from the UK, let alone the rest of the world's media. And Tim was really worried about the backlash. And in the end, he was made to stand before LegCo, LegCo Council, and pitch to them 2.2 million plus costs, plus, of course, the private jet and the flights. Uh, and he got it through, he got it approved, and he got slated, of course, leading up to the game, and then got completely, you know, eulogized and deified afterwards for being a genius to bring this in. So, yeah, we, we played our little part as a, as a small, uh, obscure, huge agency in, in brokering that uh, as well. So, yeah, and that, that kind of also indicates 
the opportunity in Asia, which still exists, you can be part of brokering something big. Yeah. I, I, to me, it just highlights, you know, the opportunities are there. And if you can bind it together and connect the dots, it's, uh, it's amazing what can be achieved. You mentioned there about backlash. What were the, what were the concerns that people had about going into this? Because I guess this is, this is one of the things that everyone's going to raise. You know, yeah, great. I, I've got this great, great idea for an event. But what were some of the concerns that people had at the time? Um, I think the concerns are the role of investment in government. So government normally doesn't, is not the primary investor, it's not the role of government. The Hong Kong government supports and encourages events, but it doesn't stand normally as the guarantor. And I think on this one, uh, they retain the gate revenues from selling the match, which recouped pretty much all of the, um, all of the cost of the outlay, which was, which was a brilliant investment. Um, but government officials prefer to say no because there's less risk. So for a government official to put their neck on the line and say, let's take the chance to take the risk, yeah. you know, was, was remarkable. Um, I'm just looking at a question here from Isabella Tun, uh, an old colleague from my ISL days about precautions at Hong Kong Stadium with infection. Well, I think as I said, Isabella, social distancing was not part of our vocabulary in 2003. We had no concept of it. As long as we wore a mask, we could stand next to each other on the metro like this. Yeah. So there were no precautions. Luckily, the disease by then had dissipated. So this thing is a different, it's a different situation altogether. We, 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 we don't have clear protection with proximity to people. And that's the challenge for everyone in the school. You've got to come up with an event which deals with this this distance that spectators need to have. You know, we're not going to be forty thousand people collectively hugging each other. It's not going to happen. Yeah, which goes into an earlier question. There, it's one question here by when do you think fans will be back in full stadiums in Asia? I, you know, I don't think anyone has any crystal ball to be able to foresee that at the moment, um, because that happened quite quickly in the SARS crisis. It 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 happened very quickly. Yeah, we had a three month blip. Um, and then we kind of went back to normal. Um, so I think we're going to be trying out this time new sporting scenarios all the way through. We're going to experiment on different sports with different formats. There's going to be a combination of technology and reality blended together. So just as we're watching now um, digital cycling, e-cycling, uh, we just had the, the Digital Swiss Five, which was, you know, tremendously successful, the most watched sports event on television since the virus. And it was a reality of, of cycling. So we're going to get used to this marriage of the two together as we adjust. Yeah. So I guess that leads into another question here. Um, you know, the general comment being, you know, human beings like we're gregarious by nature. We like being connected. Um, sporting events are a unique opportunity for people to manifest this spirit of unity and friendship. Um, after the relaxation of quarantine in some cities, we already see a great enthusiasm in the part of many people to return to normal life. Uh, good question. Based on your experience, do you believe that we can see an explosion of sporting events in the short term? And what are the main challenges for this? Kind of, all over to you. It's not going to be the same, Michael. <laughs> Our, our way of consuming sport is going to change and our, our habits that we're used to. And the, the current kind of maxim is, if what you're doing is normal, is probably wrong. That's not going to change in two months' time. You will adjust what is normal. Um, and I think the biggest challenge is going to be with, with team events and mass presentation. If you don't have crowds in the stadium, what about the 10,000 who are sitting outside the stadium or cheering? Or, 500 crowding into a pub for 100 people. So all of those things will have to be reviewed and assessed. And I think we, we will all, on this call, come up with bright, smart suggestions to mitigate risk and still give people the power and passion of coming together. That's the challenge. Yeah. I had a very interesting call yesterday with one of the Swiss Olympic Committee members and he was, you know, we were discussing this challenge and how can we use technology. And I think your point, Guy, about using the creativity around this in this room today 
uh, within our industry is one of the keys to that. And we talked about how to get in it, how to re-energize stadiums for the athletes. And there's some really clever technologies out there uh, that will enable us to do this. We just need to get in a room with a whiteboard, I think, and start nutting some of these ideas down. And I don't think we're in a space where there's no crazy ideas. I think we can really start to start from a clean sheet of paper. I think was something you said earlier this morning when we were discussing this. So. I'll go on to the next question um, e from Armel. Great question. Uh, Esports is growing with the younger generation. Uh, could the defining sport event post COVID-19 take place on screens then? Good question. Um, absolutely. Um, you know, um, the Olympic Esport Games um, with 32 disciplines and a qualification process across esports venues and homes. Um, brought to you by, presented by, absolutely, you know, all of this is open. I think we, we must have just compartmentalized how sport and esports separated. There will be an intermingling, there will be a marriage between the two. It won't just be younger generation participating in esports. It won't be um, at all. And, and, you know, you talk about younger generation, there are professional footballers winning the um, electronic arts um, FIFA game. You know, these are guys in their mid twenties who are pro footballers, um, and it's the identity of them as real athletes, as opposed to esports athletes, which is what's attracting esports fans. So that those two things are blended in. Question from Nadia Bonjour, which is a, which is a great question. It's, it's about knowledge building, um, clients investing in training staff for knowledge building, and sadly, we're not seeing enough companies use this time to build skill space with staff, build team working, um, build knowledge sharing. One company out there that's super active is, is the agency Red Torch from London, who are doing an enormous amount of team building to make their team you know, sharpen all their skills and engage better with each other. And I, you know, I, like Nadia, I'd love to see companies use this time to invest in time. It's, it's not about money. There's no money going around out there, so there's nothing to argue about anyway. Maybe there's a small contribution at some point, but I think to use, you know, uh, to change people's attitudes uh, for the better, uh, it, it's, yeah, it's a great time to do that. And I hope companies look forward and not keep looking backwards. Yeah, it's a great point. Uh, great, well raised. Um, and I agree. I think we've we have a unique opportunity to you know even through this platform we've been able to connect people and learn about different aspects of the industry learn from each other um getting beyond as you say the fear and just wait and see you know to guy's point in his presentation i think it is the opportunity now to look forward and come up with these creative ideas and, and put the put the hope and the spirit back into it i think it's great so i'm going to go on to the next question um Karina, uh, do you think some rights holders will reconsider multiple host city scenarios for their events as you wait for Euro 2020 across 30 nations and complications that came with the postponements across so many territories? Interesting, challenging question. It's, um, you know, I understand why I think came up with this idea in the first place to, to, share, to share the joy of, of arguably the, the highest caliber of football in the world, and I understand that. If I talk to my 16-year-old, um, he thinks it would be quite normal to hop on a bus and train and go to see five matches in a week. Um, at the same time, if you think about how you could host this as a lounge, where you could sit in a lounge and visit each city digitally, you could travel there, you could have Czech beer on Monday, you could have Belgian beer on Tuesday, you could have a lovely uh, Pilsa from schleswig Holstein on a Wednesday, and you could also get your uh, merchandise for that country, and you could have your tapas recipe when you're in Spain, etc. So there is a digital aspect to this that you could do that would give you an experience. Is it the same experience as going itself? No, it's not, but you know, a Zoom cocktail party versus no cocktail party, which would you prefer? So there are adjustments that can be made. Um, all of these sports organisers, the bigger they are, the bigger the changes they have to face. We'll have to review these. My point is, come up with a new concept. 
come up with a new event. The defining event in each territory probably won't be one that exists today. Yeah. No. It's going to be something we haven't thought of yet. Just quite exciting. I like. I love this. Fantastic. <laughs> Um, a great question here, and it's a thought from uh, Wang Ching. Uh, so just a thought for Guy to respond and discuss. Uh, do you feel that the marketing messaging of the high-profile events nowadays are somehow quite detached from health benefit of sports? Maybe COVID-19 will change that. The, 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 if, if we just talk about Europe for, for a moment, the, the absolute... Um, Differing government policies on whether you can go out for exercise or not, or go out on your bike or not, demonstrate there isn't really a global message um, about the benefits of sport. Um, I think the WHO um, has done um, a very good neutral job with the limited budgets it's got to cover the basics to do with how to prevent catching things. Um, does it come under their remit? Does it come under the UN's remit? Um, I think the key thing is sport should not be lost in this process. Sport will be the one thing that gives everyone joy, hope, and a sense of community. You know, it's probably the one thing that families can talk about, even though they'll have disagreements on other points. And it's the one thing which a bunch of strangers can hang together and share conversation about without leading to conflict. So. There is nothing else apart from sport which has this healing facility, this uniting facility. Uh, and that's why I think it will be a sport event, not a cultural event or any other event, which will be the turning point in most countries. Yeah. Well, we've just reached the, the, the 40 minutes and I want to say thank you. Guy, is there any last uh, closing points or anything that you'd like to share with the, the audience this morning? Um, I think the, the one thing to say is this sport platform is a, is a really good format and we've had one talk today of 38 minutes uh, I turn the challenge down that I want some of the people who are participating today to make a note in their diary and come back with ideas that could work in their country or another country about what would be that event share those ideas you've got all of the resources of all the people here we're not going to steal your idea come up with it well, if we do steal it, you know where to find us. <laughs> Indeed. You know what? It, it started here. That's great. Um, as I said at the end of your presentation, Guy, great presentation, great insights. Uh, wonderful to have that experience of, of hope. Uh, we've been through uh, and we continue to face what we're chal the challenges at the moment. Uh, but I can only echo uh, your closing comment. What's your ideas? Let's see what come forward. Let's start the discussion. And uh, let's use the power of sport to... Uh, to evolve us and change us through this through this this challenging time, I want to say thank you, Guy. I want to say especially special thanks to all of those who joined us from around the world. Um, great to have you with us. Uh, and to Guy's, Guy's closing comment, please uh, let's get these ideas down and, and start discussing and see how we can take us forward. Uh, I wish you all a very safe day. Uh, stay healthy, and uh, thanks again for joining us today. All the best, and thanks again, Guy. Cheers.